Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the final lecture on Heart of Darkness in this course on Gender and Literature. So in the previous two lectures, we had touched upon some of the uh, salient features of Heart of Darkness, some of the fundamental characteristics of a novel and why is it important uh, for the purpose of this particular course. Uh, we had talked about the uh, background out of which this novel was produced, the cultural, political background, the ideological background out of which this novel was produced. Um, and obviously, we talked about what happens inside the novel uh, in terms of the content of the novel, the narrative structure, uh, the story, uh, the themes, uh, how it is important in terms of looking at uh, the novel from the lenses of gender studies. Now, what we will do in this lecture, the final lecture on Heart of Darkness, is we will look at the location of the woman in the novel, the location of the female in the novel. We have already talked about a little bit uh, on the various female figures who appear in the novel, who uh, very seldom speak, who are lied to, who are misinformed to, etc. Uh, we had already talked about the very gendered nature of knowledge, uh, manipulatable knowledge, uh, certain knowledge which is very, you know, deeply masculinist, uh, which must not be given to the woman. Uh, and obviously, we also talked about how the women never speak in the novel. So, they are either a very intimidating presence, uh, a fearful presence, a fearful figure, or they are a very passive figure, uh, a very passive consumer of male lies, a very uh, passive consumer, consumer of male manipulation as in the case of uh, Kurtz's intended the white woman in uh, Brussels uh, who Malu goes back and lies to in terms of what happens in Congo. Now in this lecture, we'll, uh, because we already touched upon some of the basic ideas in the novel, uh, some of the fundamental features of the novel, we will talk about a little bit in details uh, in terms of the uh, and we will take an overview as well in terms of looking at gender and imperialism. Uh, and then of course, we will sort of focalize into the novel in terms of looking at the, uh, the different figures who appear in the novel uh, and how they are masculinized and feminized, you know, depending on their location and power. Now, to begin at the beginning, uh, the relationship between gender and imperialism is quite straightforward as well as quite complex. Uh, imperialism, as we know, uh, was essentially a male enterprise. Uh, it was something which uh, was completely driven by the profit principle of capitalism, uh, the profit principle of mercantile economy where you know the different companies, the different merchants, they branched out of the uh, European shows uh, in order to make more profit in uh, elsewhere you know, and obviously by elsewhere the other places included but were not limited to um, Asia, certain parts of Asia and of course Africa in the case of Heart of Darkness we see the Belgians go to Congo uh, with a you know, very naked profit principle of making money uh, out of uh, the different resources of the Congo, uh, chief of which was ivory. In the case of Heart of Darkness, it is ivory which is the principal capitalist commodity, the imperial commodity uh, which is sort of shipped back uh, into the white space from Africa. And obviously, uh, once it comes back to the white space, once it comes back to Belgium and the heartland of Europe, uh, it transforms into a commodity, it transforms into a domestic commodity, it transforms into uh, some kind of uh, an embellishment uh, for the white people. Now, so what is important to see even at a structural economic level, we find uh, a transportation uh, of uh, a quote unquote African product into uh, the white European space. Now, interestingly and many people have studied this in, in, in terms of looking at the imagery in Heart of Darkness, how it is the white ivory which is uh, sort of found out in the black continent, quote unquote dark black continent which is very stereotypical uh, racist way to look at Africa. But you know, interestingly and ironically, how this white commodity of ivory is found in this dark, dark black continent and then shipped back uh, into the white European space. And interestingly, how this wild uh, object uh, ivory, uh, you know, the, the trunk obviously of, of uh, the, the, the teeth of an owl that is domesticated when it comes back into the European space. 
So the wild, uh, untamable, exotic other uh, is domesticated when it comes back uh, into the uh, you know, heartland of Europe, into this white space where it transforms into a commodity, into a domestic commodity, which is used as an object of embellishment. Okay? So even at the structural, uh, superficial economic level, we find how this entire discourse of taming uh, is uh, prevalent in the uh, ethos of imperialism. So uh, taming an exotic object, taming a wild object, taming something which is outside, elsewhere, and bringing it back uh, into the heartland of the white space, into the heartland of Europe, uh, and making that into an object of consumption. Okay? So this entire taming of the wildness, you know, the taming of the uh, wildness, which uh, is basically uh, you know, looking at it from a cultural perspective, so this exotic other is not brought back uh, into the uh, in a European space uh, as an uh, object of display and uh, an object of consumption, etc. Now, if you remember, uh, this kind of a discourse was prevalent, um, uh, you know, throughout the uh, history of imperialism. So, if you, if you remember your Shakespeare, if you remember your Tempest, you'd find that little scene. And this is a bit of a digression, but it will help us understand uh, the point I'm trying to make over here. Uh, if you remember your Tempest, you'd understand that when uh, the two, uh, you know. Naples courtiers, Trinculo and Stefano, they look at Caliban, uh, they sort of think of him as some kind of exotic object with four legs, uh, you know, obviously a monster. But they, the primary impulse, the, the immediate impulse is to bring him back into England uh, and other parts of Europe to display him as a commodity uh, and with which they will earn money, they will make a profit by, with this visual display. So again, we find the entire ethos of imperialism was to sort of tame the exotic other, domesticate it, commodify it, bring it back and consume it as a commodity. And that was obviously the driving principle uh, which also influenced and informed the profit principle of imperialism. Okay? So ivory in Heart of Darkness becomes a very symbolic object. Right? And if you look at it from the lenses of gender studies, it is not difficult to see how that would work. So ivory becomes a metaphor for the other exotic female, right? the female other, because I use the word female over here in conjunction to the ethos of imperialism where male, female, civilized, uncivilized, black, uh, white and, and, and non-white where there is very neat and blunt binaries uh, which informed the ideology of imperialism. So the moment I say female, the exotic female, the wild female, uh, you know, I'm locating that, if I'm looking at it from the prism of imperialism, I'm locating that as outside of civilization as outside of the rational male logic. Right? Now, the whole point is to transform that into an object of consumption, right? to transform that into a commodity of consumption. So, ivory, which is this exotic uh, African other, which can be easily feminized, is now domesticated, is now brought back for the consumption of the European male, the consumption of the European uh, civilized rational self. Okay? So, even the object, and this is the interesting thing, uh, if we you know, if, you, if you're really dealing with gender studies, you know, the entire location of gender, the entire division of gender, the entire politics of gender is not just dependent on human beings. It's not just dependent on uh, you know, persons or selves. It, it, it easily spills over and uh, translates into an understanding of objects. So, certain objects are masculinized, certain objects are feminized. Okay? In this particular case, ivory is obviously the female object. Uh, is the object which is uh, out there to be possessed, out there to be consumed by the white rational male. Uh, and obviously, the entire Belgian uh, occupation of Congo, the entire Belgian location in Congo, the territorialization of Congo by the Belgians was entirely driven by the profit principle of deriving ivory out of that particular space and shipping it back into the white continent uh, for the consumption of the European male, the European rational self. So, ivory is a very important metaphor of consumption over here, and equally, it is a very important metaphor the other way, uh, you know, gender plays out even in objects, even in commodities, even in non living entities. Okay? So, this is the uh, interesting thing, and I sort of want you to pay attention to it as you read the novel at your leisure, looking at ivory not just as an object, but also as some kind of a, you know, politics or othering which is now domesticated and shipped back. And once it's shipped back, it becomes a domestic commodity, which is obviously available for endless consumption, visual or otherwise. Okay? So, this is uh, a very good example of how ideology and economy merge uh, in imperialism, how uh, ethos and economy merge in imperialism. And that was th this particular merge had always happened historically. Right? So, uh, on one hand, obviously, the entire ethos, the entire politics of gaze, the entire politics of consumption is based on the ideology of othering. 
where is the, the, where, whereby the European becomes a self, the rational civilized self and anything outside that territory becomes the non-rational uncivilized other and that is one. And B, uh, this entire ideology of uh, othering, this entire ethos of othering is informed directly by the profit principle, the economy whereby the other is now shipped back, transformed, converted into a commodity uh, you know, and then classified as a commodity and then consumed endlessly. Uh, and obviously, that drives the profit principle which govern imperialism. Okay? So, it is a nice loop, it is a very, uh, I use the word nice quite ironically, but it is a very nefarious loop, it is an evil loop, a sinister loop whereby ideology and economy uh, sort of feed each other, inform each other, uh, feed off each other uh, in a very interesting kind of a dynamic and that has historically been uh, the history of imperialism. So, if you look at any history of imperialism, we find ideology and economy at a very uh, you know interesting and sinister merge uh, at all the time and I talked about in one of the lectures previously how the history of imperialism, the genealogy of imperialism uh, sort of proceeds uh, through three M's if you remember. Uh, the first M is the, the merchant, the mercantile occupation, the mercantile presence. The second M is the military presence which is out there to, pr to protect the profit and the third M is the missionary presence which is out there to convert uh, and uh, you know make uh, the, the subjects into uh, sort of willing subjects, make the people, the natives uh, as willing consensual subjects uh, who will not question the authority of the white occupation, who will not question the, the supremacy, the supposed supremacy of the white occupation in imperialism. So, the three M's in imperialism are very, very important. But in the case of Heart of Darkness, we find it is just the first M which is out there and obviously, with some backing from the second M. So, uh, and I mentioned this in my previous lecture, the Belgian occupation of Congo is a very interesting example, it is a very rare example where no effort was made, you know, no attempt was made to masquerade as a civilizing mission. There is no, not even an effort made on the part of the white imperialists uh, to uh, make them feel a bit better about what they are doing. It was a nakedly economic exploitation, right. So, it was out there for everyone to see and it was just there for the profit principle, for the naked profit principle of imperialism. It did not even uh, you know, pretend to be anything else, it did not even pretend to be a civilizing mission, it did not even pretend to be uh, some kind of a, a missionary mission, you know, whereby uh, you know, we tell people that we went there to rescue the natives who are barbarians. Uh, no such ideology, no such rhetoric was uh, required in the case of the Belgian occupation of Congo. So, as I mentioned, this is a nakedly economic enterprise and Marlowe obviously the narrator in Heart of Darkness is an agent, an imperial agent, uh, you know, someone who works for a Belgian company uh, and equally someone who is sent out there uh, you know and uh, you know his job is to get Kurtz back and Kurtz is obviously an imperial agent who had gone rogue. Uh, so, I talked about Kurtz in the previous lecture uh, how he becomes a very interesting case of masculinity. Uh, he is a product of this European you know metropolitan masculinity. Uh, who goes, who is sent uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the imperial other, the other space, uh, the terra incognita and over there he cracks up, over there he uh, sort of becomes a rogue masculine self, he turns his back to the imperial project and becomes a problem to the project. So much so, that another imperial project has to send someone uh, to get him back, to retrieve him. Okay. So, uh, the location of gender in Heart of Darkness is very, very important, the location of the male, uh, the men and the female. Uh, presence in how the darkness is very, very important uh, and equally uh, we are not just talking about the human beings away, we are talking about the uh, commodities, we are talking about the landscape, we are talking about the natural presence, we are talking about the objects. So, all these things uh, are masculinized and feminized in the course of the novel. So, we talked about how Congo, the river Congo, uh, if you read the descriptions that Mala uses in river Congo, it, it obviously becomes a symbol, a metaphor for the other female you know. So, you are sort of flowing into Congo endlessly, you are surrounded by a wilderness you do not recognize, it is completely unfamiliar to you uh, and so this exotic other, the other space the Congo becomes uh, in the novel is a very good example of a feminization uh, of the exotic other space. You know, you not, you not, you do not know, you do not know the logical coordinates, you do not know the rational coordinates, you do not know the geographical coordinates. So, the entire Eurocentric understanding of geography, the entire Eurocentric understanding of nature, the entire Eurocentric understanding of uh, uh, landscapes and presence. So, all that collapses uh, as Malo floats into Congo and, and obviously, uh, the entire presence of Congo becomes uh, a bit of an amniotic presence, uh, an amniotic because of the, the female othering self and it becomes excessive amniotic 
uh, it's wild. Uh, so, in other words, uh, if you look at it from the lenses of gender studies, it's something that a white man doesn't understand. It's something that a white rational man would fail to understand. And an entire novel, uh, you, could, you could read the entire novel as a failure of understanding. Uh, you know, and obviously, when I use the word failure of understanding, I use the word understanding as a located category. Uh, it's, it's not a universal category. So, uh, you know, when I say that Marlowe's logic fails in Heart of Darkness, Marlowe's reason or the entire rationality of Marlowe fails in Heart of Darkness, I'm not talking about rationality or reason uh, or logic as universal categories. I'm looking at these things as Eurocentric male phallogocentric categories. I used the word phallogocentric previously. If you remember, it's a combination of phallocentric and logocentric. It's the male logical principle. And when I say male logical principle, what I obviously mean is it's a white European male logical principle. And this entire white construct, this construct of whiteness, this construct of white rationality, this construct of white logic, it, it fails, it collapses in Heart of Darkness uh, quite spectacularly. An entire novel is about this particular collapse, right? So, uh, if you're looking at the novel uh, from the lenses of gender studies, it's, it's important that, you know, along with looking at the human figures who appear in Heart of Darkness, who don't speak, who do speak, uh, and how they're embodied in the novel is equally important uh, for us to we want to study this novel from the lenses of gender studies to look at uh, these are categories like knowledge, landscape, nature, this non-human categories in other words you know and how these are uh, you know broken and divided and subdivided into male and female categories of understanding. Okay? So, uh, with this kind of a uh, overview, let's dive into the novel, let's look at the novel, let's see what happens in the novel uh, in terms of, you know, and if you can dig up more, uh, you know, interesting readings uh, out of Heart of Darkness in terms of looking at it from the lenses of gender studies. Okay? Now, obviously, the novel is about a man called Marlowe, uh, you know, who was sort of sent as an imperial agent, he works for a Belgian company and he's sent to work for the company in Congo and he, you know, he goes out to do his job uh, and then the entire novel is about how he gets more and more dissolution, how he gets more and more confused, how he gets more and more unsettled by his imperial experience. And in that sense, it's quite uh, relatable. You can connect it uh, interestingly to George Orwell's shooting an elephant because that too is about the unsettling of the white European male uh, when the white male goes to this non-white space and looks at imperialism as a dirty thing. You know, he recognizes that imperialism really is a dirty job. It's, it's nothing glorious about it. It's nothing romantic about it uh, at all. Okay? And this entire knowledge uh, of this evil of imperialism uh, generates cynicism, generates dissolution, generates despair, and most importantly, it generates guilt. So, both Heart of Darkness and uh, Shooting Elephant is about the white man's guilt to a certain extent. It's about the white man getting too close to imperialism and looking at imperialism from too closely and once you see it uh, as what it really is, you cannot unsee it anymore. You've seen it too well, you've seen it too close uh, to unsee it, to, to forget about it. You can't unremember it anymore. Okay? And Marlowe, the entire uh, crisis in Marlowe, it almost becomes a neurotic crisis, uh, an existential crisis, is about uh, you know, this, his inability to forget what he had seen, his inability to unsee what he had seen. And at some point in the novel, he, t he actually tells his audience, uh, do you see the story, right? And it's, in, it's important, do you see the story? He's not saying, do you listen to the story? Are you listening to the story? He's, he's almost trying to make an appeal that it's a visual thing. I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to show you what had happened in, to me in Congo. I'm trying to tell you what had happened to me in Congo, but in a way that should appear to you as a scene. So, his entire question is, do you see the story, right? And obviously, the audience cannot see the story and that's the whole crisis of narration in Heart of Darkness. Uh, he cannot narrate to the audience what had happened to him in Congo. And that informs his masculinity crisis to a certain extent. Because remember, uh, as I mentioned in my previous lecture and I sort of winded up that lecture in this note, uh, Heart of Darkness is also, uh, along with many other things, a failure of the classic realist tradition of narration. Okay? So, if you look at Heart of Darkness as a, as a classic realist novel, because the kind of narration that Marlowe wants to uh, generate, Marlowe wants to use to convey his experience in, in Congo uh, is a classic realist narration, is a classic realist tradition of narrating. Now, obviously, that classic realist tradition of uh, narration is very, very Eurocentric. Uh, it, it depends, it, it, has a, uh, you know, it has a presupposition that the narrator knows everything, you know, the narrator has entire knowledge of uh, before, present, before, now and after. 
uh, is omniscient narration. The narrator knows everything in terms of what's happening in other people's minds. The narrator knows everything in terms of what's, uh, what are the intentions of each character. And that obviously it is a myth. You can never know it. You can never know uh, what happens in other person's mind. You can never know, uh, you know entirely what happened to you in the past. You can never know what is happening to you at the moment. And you know, most importantly, you can never know what will happen to you in the future. So, this entire, this entire idea of classic realist narration is basically a, a fantastic construct. It's a construct of fantasy. And these are what fantastic quite literally over here. Right? Now, what Heart of Darkness does uh, among many things, I mean, uh, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, it shows the constructive nature of logic, it shows the constructive nature of Eurocentric understanding, it shows the constructive logic of imperialism and the supremacy of you know, the white man's supremacy uh, in a non white space. But equally, uh, from a literary level, and it's important because we, at the end of the day, we are literary students, and it's important that we locate the novel as a literary work. Equally, Heart of Darkness is about the constructed quality of the classic realist narration. Right? It's about t it's sort of telling you, uh, showing quite spectacularly that a classic realist tradition uh, of narration is a construct which will fail uh, if we're using it to narrate an experience which is outside the European space. Right? So, uh, the entire uh, story of Heart of Darkness is a story that happens in Congo, uh, in outside Belgium, outside Europe, outside a white civilized space. And obviously, if we're using the white uh, rational instrument of narration to talk about a uh, non-white experience, this is going to be completely incommensurate. It's, com it's going to be completely incongruous because we're using a tool, the, the narrative tool, which is informed by European, European logic, European rationality, European reason. But in using that tool to talk about a non-European experience, a non-European space, a non-European uh, landscape, and that's not going to work. It's completely incongruous. And among many things, how the darkness is about the incongruity, and the incongruity between the, uh, the, the medium and the matter, the form and the content. Right? The, the content is non-European, the content is outside of Europe, where the form that Marlowe is trying to use, the, the, the manner that Marlowe is trying to use to deploy in how the darkness is a classic realist tradition, which is failing. Right? So, that is one of the main reasons why how the darkness is such an ontologically dense novel. And it takes you such a lot of time to read it, despite its brevity. It's a 90 page novel, some people call it a novella, but it takes an enormous amount of time to read it. And it's precisely because it's about the failure of narration. It's a narration which is, which is constantly deconstructing itself. Uh, so, it's not a linear narration, it's not something which you can passively consume because it has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, it's a narration, it's a, it's a kind of narrative structure which is basically about uh, breaking itself as a narrative structure. So, in that sense, it has got a self-destructive, self-deconstructive quality. Uh, but obviously, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, the, the Heart of Darkness or Joseph Conrad uh, does not celebrate this deconstruction. He is lamenting this deconstruction, he is mourning this deconstruction because he is a very conservative writer. Uh, remember, he is very conservative, his position politically was very, very conservative. So, he is lamenting the loss of the Eurocentric structure of narration. Right? Uh, so, he wishes, I mean there is almost this uh, nostalgic uh, you know, understanding in Marlowe that if only this had worked, if only this classic realist tradition had worked, and he realizes that it's not working. He realizes that his style of narration is failing, is collapsing. And also, if you look at it from a gendered perspective, the entire classic realist style of narration is very, very phallogocentric, right? It's very male centric, it's very white European male centric style of narration, and that is failing, right? So, like male reason, like male logic, like male rationality, like male uh, in a way of understanding the white male understanding of nature, uh, the white male understanding, the white male manner uh, of narration too is failing in heart of darkness. So, uh, like ivory, which I just, I just talked about ivory and how ivory is feminized in the novel, uh, how that is appropriated by the masculine profit principle and consumed by the masculine profit principle. The narrative in Heart of Darkness too uh, is basically a hysterical narrative, right? So it, it starts off, uh, you know, it, it, it's supposed to be a male rational control narrative, but it becomes more and more hysterical. It, it becomes more and more emasculated. It becomes more and more nervous. So it's entirely a nervous neurotic narration in Heart of Darkness, right? And in that sense, it is a very interesting study of gender because the very narrative of Heart of Darkness is ungendered and then regendered. So, Marlowe ends up being a hysterical man. 
and hysteria as you know was traditionally at that point of time at least was classified as a female malady and, and Ellen Showalter has got a ma magnificent book on this it's just called a female malady if you want to know more about the history of hysteria that's the book I would recommend uh, by Ellen Showalter the female malady it talks about hysteria and how that was uh, in a very sexist kind of a way it's medical sexism how that was sort of classified as a female disease uh, and men never had hyster you know, hysteria uh, presumably. But heart of darkness is about male hysteria. Heart of darkness is about the, how the male neurotic structure fails. Uh, it sort of deconstructs itself uh, you know, neurotically uh, in its attempt to tell the story about what happened to the man outside of Europe. And obviously, it's a failed attempt. It's a nervous neurotic attempt. And so, the very narrative of heart of darkness is a nervous hysterical narrative. And in that sense, it's an emasculated narrative. So, the entire uh, idea of classic realist narration which has this marvelous overarching logic you know where the narrator knows exactly what happens before uh, now and after you know in the presence of other people's characters uh, in the presence of the mind the character's mind everything is known everything is understood he has absolute knowledge of everyone that entire uh, hubris that entire arrogance of male understanding fails in heart of darkness so Marlowe is a very different kind of a narrator in heart of darkness he's a nervous hysterical male narrator so, in that sense, the narration in Heart of Darkness, like Ivory, is a very gendered kind of an entity. Okay? So, we talked about uh, the Ivory in Heart of Darkness, we talked about Congo in Heart of Darkness, uh, and if you contrast Congo with Thames, the river Thames in London, you find they are very two different kind of rivers. So, but interestingly, Malo makes a connection at the beginning in Heart of Darkness that, you know, this too was once, uh, you know, in, in before civilization. Right? So, he's referring to the point in history where uh, London was uncivilized, quote unquote uncivilized, before the entire uh, you know, enlightenment, before the European movement, entire European understanding of civilization happened, London too was just another dark space. Right? And this is interesting because he begins the entire novel by talking about London as saying, you know, this too was once one of the dark spaces, you know, this too was once what Africa is now. So, uh, what is interesting in Heart of Darkness is the mutability uh, of what we call civilized and uncivilized. It is a historical mutability, it is a changeability. Uh, and what is civilized today can become uncivilized tomorrow, and equally, what is uncivilized today can become civilized tomorrow. So, again, the point is uh, to move away from the absolute understanding of civilization, to move away from the absolute understanding of reason, of supremacy, of logic, of rationality and to have a more relativistic understanding of these categories, a more relativistic understanding of civilization. So, what is civilization now can become uncivilization tomorrow and equally what is not civilized today can become civilized tomorrow. It is all about historical genealogy, it is about the movement in history. Right? So, uh, how to darkness in many ways becomes a very interesting commentary as well as a critique of an understanding of civilization. Right? And one of the many things that a novel does interestingly is it looks at these kind of categories as non-universal categories as I mentioned. Right? Logic, reason, narrative structure, uh, knowledge, um, civilization, supremacy, racial supremacy. So, all these things which you know imperialism uh, was trying its best to promote as universal categories and obviously, it did it through an ex through a mediated through enlightenment. So, enlightenment and uh, imperialism were you know very interesting bedfellows. They basically informed each other as I mentioned the ideology and the economy informed each other, they fed off each other, uh, they you know influenced each other, they created they constructed each other in uh, this magnificent enterprise of looking at imperialism as some kind of a civilizing mission, some kind of a good mission which is not nakedly profit making, profit making right. But obviously, what Heart of Darkness does, it cracks open this nexus, it cracks open this uh, very, very nefarious nexus between ideology and economy. And it shows you, uh, you know, the economic principle in Heart of Darkness, uh, the Congo in Heart of Darkness is a naked economist exploitation, uh, you know, it is basically an exploitative space where the white imperialists were settled uh, with the sole motive of making profit. There is no other motive at all, as I mentioned. Uh, there is not even a guise, there is not even an attempt to masquerade as missionaries, to masquerade as some kind of a civilizing presence. It is just there uh, to make profit. It is just there. Uh, to exploit economically, to take the resources and convert those into commodities and ship those back uh, to the European metropolis where those will be consumed endlessly by the European consumers. Okay? So, uh, the river Congo in Heart of Darkness is gendered, uh, you know, the narration of Heart of Darkness is gendered, uh, the ivory in Heart of Darkness is gendered, uh, and obviously, Marlowe himself uh, is ungendered 
in some ways. And this is uh, the next point that I'm going to make. Now, like goods, Marlow 2 is an imperial agent. And when I say, when I use the word imperial agent, I obviously uh, the automatic expectation, the automatic assumption is that the imperial agent must be quite masculinist. Because imperialism is a masculinist principle. It was entirely based on the profit principle of logic, rationality, uh, profit making, expansion. So, it is all about economic expansion, uh, it is all about economic invasion, it is all about conquest, uh, territorialization. So, all these are very, very phallocentric uh, principles, very, very phallocentric uh, you know, performances, very, very phallocentric uh, categories, all right, invading and other space, uh, you know, uh, making profit. Uh, this expansionist principle of economic uh, pro, you know, profit. So, all these are very, very phallic male masculinist kind of understanding uh, of, of life, of economy, of civilization, etcetera. Right? So, uh, when I use the word imperial agent, uh, the automatic assumption uh, would be a man uh, who is basically in conformity with this kind of logic, with this kind of an economic system, with this kind of an exploitative system, this kind of a logical system. And how the darkness uh, gives you two men, when well, there are many men in how the darkness, but you know, the, the two principal men in how the darkness are obviously Kutz, Colonel Kutz, and obviously Marlowe, the narrator. Now, both are imperial agents, uh, and, but both are basically, uh, they, they both crack up in different degrees. Now, Kutz cracks up in a way which becomes a threat to imperialism, which becomes a threat to the very uh, system of imperialism which had created them historically. Right, so here, you know, if you look at the descriptions of Kurtz in the Heart of Darkness, we almost know nothing about Kurtz. We almost know nothing about how he looks, what he is, uh, you know, what he does. But we do know, and it, the novel makes explicitly clear that the entire Europe went into the making of Kurtz. Now, when I say the entire Europe uh, went into the making of Kurtz, it's very tempting to look at Kurtz less as a human figure and more as a symptom more as an, as an extension, more as an extreme extension, an extreme embodiment of imperialism. Right? So, he is less of a human being and more of an extreme embodiment, more of a symptom, uh, which becomes a pathological symptom, because you know he becomes a disease presence in Hall of Darkness, a disease presence who dies in the end with, by uttering the horror, the horror. It is something which consumes itself, uh, it is got a self cons, you know, consuming kind of a quality about it. Okay? Now, when you look at Kurtz as some kind of an extreme extension, an extreme embodiment of, of imperialism, it perfectly falls in place. Because, you know, then what we are doing essentially is looking at Kurtz as an extreme example, an extreme extension of the masculinist principle of imperialism. The profit principle, the expansionist principle, the economy principle, the greed principle, it is the principle of greed, the principle of lust for power, of territorialization, etcetera. So, he becomes an extreme extension of all these principles, right. And this extreme embodiment is so nakedly present in Heart of Darkness that it, he almost becomes, he almost generates a sense of guilt, a sense of shame, a sense of unease uh, to the European imperialist. The, the, the European imperialist center is now uneasy with him, because now it is very nakedly evident that he is an extreme embodiment of all these naked profit principles, of this evil uh, uh, principles of imperialism. And now it becomes uneasy for imperialism, now it becomes uneasy for imperialism in terms of you know, uh, dealing with him. Right? Because he is now becoming a nakedly rogue agent. Right? So, Kurtz, uh, one reading of Kurtz could be, he is less of a human being and more of a symptom, and more of a condition, uh, a European condition during the times of imperialism, uh, a condition which is informed by uh, an overdrive of greed, an overdrive of profit principle, an overdrive of expansionist principle, an overdrive of this entire rationality principle. So, the point is, if you push all these too far, if you push this entire imperialist greed, imperialist rationality, imperialist you know, profit making principle too far, this entire masculinist project, if you push it too far, what you get is colonial goods. What you get is a cracked up entity, someone who cracks up, someone who completely breaks up uh, and then becomes a problem. Right? So, he becomes, he very quickly transforms from perfection to problem. And this is the, the, the entire idea of looking at goods. So, he starts off as a perfection. Uh, he is the best that Europe can have, he is the best that Europe can make. The entire Europe uh, you know, went into the making of goods, as the narrator keeps telling you uh, in the course of the novel. So, he is the, the example of perfection in the novel. He is a perfect agent, the perfect imperial agent. But what if you push perfection too far? 
what if you push perfection to an extent that it becomes a problem and that's exactly what happens to good. So, from very quickly uh, he converts from this masculinist perfection to a uh, hysterical problem. So, it becomes a hysterical problem to such an extent that you know now the European imperialist centre has to send someone to get rid of him. Right? So, his turning into a monster, he is turning into a rogue, he is turning into a problem uh, is very similar and again you can make connections with uh, novels such as Frankenstein and Mary Shelley. What do the entire ambition, the entire uh, drive, the entire lust is to you know create a male, create a male progeny which is absolutely perfect. So, you know I am just making a bit of a digression over here, but it will help you to understand what the point I am trying to make. So, Victor Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's novel uh, you know his desire is to make a transhuman progeny uh, you know which will be perfect, which will embody the perfection of the human species to such an extent that you know it will do away with the female presence, it will do away with the female requirement during procreation. So, the entire project is a male project, it is a bioscientific male project uh, and the idea is to make the perfect progeny, the perfect offspring. Now, obviously, that goes terribly wrong and the reason why it goes too wrong because you know it, it, it goes too far. So, you know the perfection goes too far in Mary Shelley's novel and Victor Frankenstein's experiment to the extent that you know it, it very quickly converts from perfection to a problem, uh, it becomes a monster uh, and the word monster obviously you know is, is a metaphor for excess, it is a metaphor for aberration, it is a metaphor for departure from the normative principle, it is a metaphor for departure from deviance, uh, from the norm etcetera. So, the monster in Victor Frankenstein's uh, experiment is a departure from the norm. So, it is too much of a perfection, it is too much of an extension, it is too much of an extreme extension. Now, it is so extreme as an extension that it becomes a departure. The same happens with Kurtz in Heart of Darkness. He is such an extreme embodiment uh, of the imperial project, he is such an extreme embodiment of the imperial mission of profit making, of territorialization, of expansion etcetera. Now, it becomes a departure to the extent that now it becomes a monster in the very same way as uh, Victor Frankenstein's progeny becomes a monster. So, you can make these connections very well and obviously, Mary Shelley's novel is a very strong, it is a magnificent uh, feminist critique of this entire bioscientific phallogocentric experiment. Again, it is very, very phallogocentric, it is about a male white scientist trying to control the world, trying to create a progeny, uh, you know trying to create a system which will not require the female biological presence anymore. So, the entire life giving process can be done in a scientific lab which again is a very white male space of reason, logic, scientific understanding and that is the whole project in, 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 in Victor Frankenstein's uh, effort and he wants to make uh, you know human beings out of a lab which will not require uh, females anymore, which will not require the mother figure anymore, which will not require uh, any kind of female intervention anymore. So, the entire idea was to do away with the female, the entire idea is to extend the European uh, in a male understanding of rationality and scientific logic uh, to the point that you know it becomes a self perpetuating system, but of course, that experiment goes terribly wrong, uh, he creates what is a monster because it is a, a radical departure from the norm and then it becomes a problem and then he wants to annihilate it, he wants to kill it. Very same way and this is a parallel that you could draw on, this is a parallel that you could write on uh, probably as uh, parts of your assignment, as parts of your uh, you, know, uh, you know written projects and if you want to make that into something uh, more sophisticated, something more uh, elegant, you can also consider writing a paper on this, a comparison between uh, the male desire uh, in Victor Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's novel and, the, and, and that of the imperial desire in Heart of Darkness and how both desires go tell be wrong, both desires get disrupted, get unsettled by what they produce. So, Kurtz is a product, Kurtz is a produce of the imperial mission. So, he is this extension, the, the extreme extension of the phallogocentric imperial principle and then it, it, it is such an extreme ex exam, extension that it becomes a rogue presence, it becomes a diseased presence, it becomes a pathological presence to the extent that another agent uh, has now been sent to get rid of him, to retrieve him, to bring him back if possible. Now, again, if you watch the film based on Heart of Darkness, Apocalypse Now, which is a magnificent film directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, you know, it's got a really a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, setting. So the setting is Vietnam War. The U.S. Vietnam War. Uh, you know, this notorious war the U.S. had on the Vietnam, and how uh, you know Colonel Kurtz in that kind of a setting is a perfect soldier. Uh, he's a perfect embodiment of the military, the U.S. military. Now he's so perfect. Now it's such an extreme extension of that perfection that it becomes uh, very quickly a problem. He turns against the system which had historically created it.
uh, him. Uh, and now he becomes a renegade soldier. He becomes a rebel. Why? Because he's such a perfect ex example of an extension of that kind of a system. Okay? So and I do recommend that you watch the film, uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, by Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, because, you know, all, it's a different setting, though. It's not Congo. Uh, it's sort of contextualized in a modern setting. So the setting is the Vietnam War, but the, the principles are the same. Uh, it's white, uh, European, it's not European anymore, it's American, but again, it's white territorialization, it's white imperialism, it's white invasion, uh, with the sole uh, motive of making profit, uh, of controlling uh, a non-white population, of making them into willing subjects. And, and obviously, this is about uh, greed, this is about the overdrive of ambition, uh, territorialization, the male desire, etc. Uh, so it, it's perfectly connectable, uh, the, the Congo uh, condition in Heart of Darkness and the Vietnam War condition in Apocalypse Now is perfectly relatable. The, it, there's a lot of structural similarities, a lot of uh, thematic similarity and that's the reason why it works so well as a film which is an adaptation of the novel. Okay, so now to come back to uh, the, the main point that we, we are sort of talking about, we are dealing with in this particular lecture the gendering of objects in Heart of Darkness, the gendering of entities of figures in Heart of Darkness and how one figure and this is interesting, how one figure uh, you know, you know is, is mutable in terms of the gender politics. So, for example, uh, uh, Kurtz in Heart of Darkness, uh, it, it starts off with you know being this perfectly European male figure, this perfectly European um, phallogocentric self, you know, you know, constructed by Europe, constructed by European imperialism, etc. But now, uh, once he is in Congo, uh, he becomes uh, a problem in the sense that he becomes the other. And obviously, as I mentioned a little while ago, the other is always female. Uh, you know, from uh, in, the, in, the, in the prism of imperialism, uh, in the politics of imperialist gaze, the other is always feminized. So, in a very interesting sense, Kurtz is also feminized. He, he becomes uh, the other uh, of imperialism. So, from an insider, he transforms into an other. So, you know, he quickly converts from a phallogocentric insider to an exotic other. And he's quite exoticized as well, by the way, in Heart of Darkness. So, we, get, we never get to know uh, how it looks like. It's a very nebulous, shadowy kind of a presence in Heart of Darkness. So we never get to know uh, his physical details, his uh, no, physiognomy details. Uh, you know, we just get to know. Uh, you know, he's almost like a spectral presence, a shadowy spectral presence. He's a spectre which haunts imperialism. So quite literally, and this is in connection to the reading we just did of looking at Kurtz as a symptom, uh, as a condition, a pathological uh, you know, extension. So he becomes less of a human being and more of a spectral, shadowy, pathological presence in Heart of Darkness. Okay? So this is an in interesting condition in Heart of Darkness that we need to look at. And also Marlowe, the narrator in Heart of Darkness. So he starts off with uh, being this uh, phallogocentric, uh, you know, male, white European male in Heart of Darkness. But notice how, observe how in the novel he is very quickly emasculated. He is very quickly uh, hystericized, right? So he becomes hysterical. He's a hysterical, neurotic narrator in Heart of Darkness. He can't quite understand, doesn't quite know how to go about his narrative, how to produce his narrative in a logical, rational way, uh, which will make sense which will uh, you know, be available as a commodity to its listeners. So, an entire Heart of Darkness you know, is about the failure of converting your story into a commodity, the failure of converting your experience into a commodity. And this is interesting because in this, in this sense, in this tradition, uh, in this reading, Heart of Darkness completely deconstructs uh, or goes against the contemporary no novels which are written at that time, the contemporary adventure novels which are written at that time, which basically relied entirely on converting the exotic story into a, a consumable commodity. Right? So, if you read uh, Ryder Haggard's novel uh, written at that time, which are basically male adventure tales about imperialism, uh, about this exotic other, uh, and how everything is very neatly defined, uh, neatly binarized, uh, civilized, uncivilized, black, white, uh, you know, uh, logical, illogical, etc. Uh, and that, that becomes a very consumable commodity. Th that, that kind of storytelling, that kind of a storytelling tradition, that kind of a narrative tradition is very quickly consumable, uh, is very quickly consumed as a commodity by the European listeners. Now, that does not happen in Heart of Darkness. Uh, you know, it is to a large deal, to a great extent, it is about the uh, inability to convert the experience into a narration to convert the experience into a narrative. So, in that sense, it is a, it's a failure of the phallogocentric project, it is a failure of the masculinist project. Right? So, in that sense, uh, Heart of Darkness is a very interesting novel uh, to look at how uh, 
the entire uh, project of imperialism, the entire uh, phallocentric understanding of imperialism fails as a structure. And if we look at the woman in Heart of Darkness, if we look at the female presence in Heart of Darkness, uh, they never speak, the African woman never speaks, uh, no African speaks in Heart of Darkness, which is one of the reasons why a lot of post-colonial critics such as uh, Chinua Achebe uh, have had great reservations about this novel. They have uh, treated this novel as some kind of a racist novel because uh, Conrad uh, doesn't make any African speak. But you know, uh, we, let's not take any side over here because that's not what we're doing. We're not doing this as a post-colonial reading. But it's interesting. It's it's important to understand that this novel was written at a time when, you know, most of the stories about Africa, most of the stories about Asia, most of the stories about non-European spaces were exotic stories. Were stories about uh, the exotic Orient or the exotic African other or the exotic dark other, etc. Now, in that sense, Heart of Darkness is a very interesting departure because it's not about exoticization at all, right? It doesn't exoticize Africa. Uh, it basically looks at Africa uh, as an ununderstandable uh, entity. You can't understand it, and this uh, failure of understanding uh, is also, to a great extent, the failure of European logic the failure of European rationality, the failure of European reason. So more than anything else, it is not really so concerned about Africa uh, and uh, as it's concerned about Europe, out of darkness. It's, about, it's a very spectacular novel which basically tells you that entire system of rationality, logic, reasoning, these are constructed systems. These are very topical local systems which do not work once you uh, get it out of the context. Okay? So in that sense, it's a very interesting novel. Uh, and obviously, uh, Conrad doesn't make any African speak. Obviously, uh, the entire gaze in How to Darkness is a white European gaze, right? So it's a white European looking at the dark continent, looking at the dark, sort of quote unquote, black continent as a heart of darkness, etc. So that is all true, that is all there. But equally, it's a gaze which also looks back at Europe. It's a gaze which also looks back at the entire construct of Europe, European civilization, European rationality, and then reveals all these things as hollow things, as you know, uh, you know, the entire idea of ideology, uh, imperialism, the entire idea of civilization, the entire idea of enlightenment are revealed to be hollow categories. And in that sense, this is the reason, this is a very good uh, way of understanding Kurtz's dying words, the horror, the horror. Okay? So that, that, that's something you can think about, that's something you can explore further. What does Kurtz mean when he says the horror and the horror when he dies? These are just the two things he says in the entire novel, the horror, the horror. Now one reading of this, uh, the horror and the horror uh, is uh, an understanding, uh, the knowledge of nothingness with which Kurtz dies. Because mind you, Kurtz uh, is very much or was very much an insider in imperialism, an insider in enlightenment logic, an insider in the European system of reason and you know, logic and rationality, etc, etc, etc. Now once it becomes, once it converts from being an insider into an outsider, uh, that conversion, that transition, that movement uh, is also accompanied by the knowledge of nothingness, by the knowledge that he doesn't know, he, he knows now that all these entire lovely ideas about imperialism, uh, you know, civilization, logic, rationality, these are hollow ideas, right? These are ideas which are constructed ideas. These are ideas which, which can be deconstructed, which can be uh, you know, blown away uh, in the face of other experiences. And this realization, this knowledge of nothingness uh, is what generates the horror, the horror and goods, right? So it is basically the European male uh, looking at at itself as a dying entity. Okay? And I use the word male as a metaphor over here. The European male, which is basically a construct of reason, rationality, logic, uh, etc. And that basically begins to deconstruct. And it's literally the dying words. So you know what I mean when I say the dying words. It's the dying words of the European phallocentric system. Uh, which had historically informed imperialism. So again, we are looking at Kurtz not as an object, not as a human being, but as a system, as a symptom, as a condition, right? A condition which recognizes its own defect, a condition which looks back at its own system and recognizes and reveals it to be a faulty system, to be uh, an evil system, to be uh, a hollow system, right? And so, literally, it's a dying words, the dying words of a Eurocentric logical system, the horror, the horror. So one, uh, and this is a very 
interesting way to look at Kurds and I would encourage you to explore it further uh, and look at Kurds as an example, as an embodiment of this hollowness, as an embodiment of the knowledge of hollowness, as an embodiment of a condition which recognizes civilization, European civilization as hollowness. Okay? So, in that sense uh, it, it, it falls in perfectly, it falls in place perfectly in terms of looking at Kurds uh, as, a system, as a symptom, as a pathological presence, as a condition. Right, uh, a, a condition which looks back and comments on the entire European discourse uh, of civilization, imperialism, enlightenment uh, as hollow discourses, as constructed categories of knowledge. Right, and that's why he comments. That's why he says the horror of the horror when he dies. So these are literally the dying words uh, of an insider uh, who now knows too much, who now knows too well that these constructs are in the end constructs. Okay. So, in that sense, uh, uh, again, there is a degree of emasculation, there is a degree of uh, you know breaking away from the male mold, breaking away from the phallocentric mold, because you know it, that's, that kind of mold, that system is not revealed to be a faulty system, is not revealed to be an evil system, not just faulty, an evil system is a deceptive system. However, as we mentioned in the previous lecture, when Marlowe comes back, uh, because you know he too has a glimpse of the hollowness, he too has a glimpse of the aura. So he knows too, uh, you know, like Kurtz, he knows too that the entire system of imperialism, the entire system of this profit-making principle, this expansionist principle of economy, etc., etc., is a very evil system. He knows that too. But when he comes back, interestingly, to the European space, he cannot talk about it freely. So he can try. He can make an attempt, he can make an effort to tell this to his male interlocutors. And again, notice a very homosocial, this very, very uh, uh, male centric uh, understanding, this very male centric attempt to impart the story. So, uh, what happened to in Congo to Malo can only be told to men, that is the assumption, right. So, it can only be told to male interlocutors, to male listeners, uh, because you know it is something only the men would understand and that is the assumption, that is the presupposition that Marlowe has. So, he floats in, uh, in a little boat in, in, in Thames in London and he talks about his experiences in Congo to a group of men who, who could not care less, they are bored to death. So most of them go to sleep in the course of a story, only the main narrator, the narrator who is telling you the story of Marlowe's story. So, it is got a Chinese box structure as I mentioned and again in that sense it is very uh, closely related to Frankenstein because that too has a Chinese box structure as you know. So, Robert Walton tells the story of Victor Frankenstein who, and then there is a story of the monster etcetera, etcetera. So, you know all that you know is quite structurally similar in, in Heart of Darkness as well. But the point is uh, the, the knowledge that Marlowe has and this is something I did talk about in the previous class as well, the knowledge that Marlowe has, knowledge of nothingness that Marlowe has from Kurtz, that is a knowledge which presumably can only be transferred, can only be conveyed to men uh, who can consume it. Now, of course, the men do not understand it. You know, the European men who have not been to Congo, they do not understand it except the narrator who makes an effort to understand presumably because he tells us a story uh, presumably in that politics of narration. But the, the, the interesting thing is when Marlowe goes to the, the woman, Kurtz is intended in, in Brussels in Belgium, there uh, he has to lie about, the, uh, about Kurtz's dying words because she uh, asks him directly categorically, so what were his dying words? She wants to know the dying words of uh, uh, her, her fiance and Marlowe has to lie to her, Marlowe has to tell her that you know he died with your name on his lips. So, he does not tell her his dying words for the horror, the horror. So, you, he died with your name on his lips. And again by your name uh, you know when I talk about when I say when I look at the entire presence of Kurtz's intended. So, she becomes again a metaphor of this misinformed female of this manipulated female in heart of darkness, someone is manipulated by the men, someone who is lied to, someone who is misinformed, someone who is sort of comforted uh, in a very uh, you know deceptively by the men uh, who want her not to know. So, again at the level of knowledge uh, epistemologically speaking, so we have an example of epistemological deception uh, and a knowledge based deception. Right? So, she does not get the knowledge of uh, what happened to the men in Congo, what happened to her intended in the Congo, what happened to her fiance in the Congo. So, she gets a very romantic report and again the romantic report that she gets in the end is a deceptive report as we all know because we have read the novel, we know what Kurtz had gone through, we know what he had wanted to say, he, he, we know uh, the, what he meant by the horror, the horror we can speculate on it, 
he definitely did not mention her uh, in his dying words. Now, having said that, there is an ironic truth in the statement that Marlow is giving to Kurtz's intended, right? So, uh, when Marlow tells Kurtz's intended that he died with your name on his lips, so if you look at your name as a metaphor, by your name, uh, you know, if you look at it as the female, the female presence, the white female in Europe, right? If if you look at if you look at this reading in that way, where uh, Kurtz is dying with the name of the European female, the European white female in his lips as is dying, that becomes ironically true because the European female, as we just realized, is an example, is a metaphor of uh, a presence which is deceived, right? Which is manipulated, which is tricked, right? She is tricked into believing into something. And again, in that sense, she becomes a hollow presence. Right? She is someone who is lied to incessantly. She is someone who is deceived incessantly. She is someone who is tricked incessantly. So, in a way, she becomes a metaphor of deception of someone who is deceived, a metaphor of a false life, a metaphor for a lie, a metaphor for hollowness. So, in a very ironic kind of an inversion, uh, this becomes almost ironically and paradoxically true, perversely true. So, I am talking about paradoxically as a perverse example. It is perversely true that Kuz did mention, I mean this is exactly what he meant. He meant the hollowness of European logic, he meant the hollowness of European knowledge, he meant the hollowness of European reason. And Kurz's intended becomes an embodiment of the hollowness because she is this helpless passive female who is lied to by the European male agents. So, you can see the binary over here, the male and the female. The men have the knowledge, the women do not have the knowledge. The women are not given the knowledge. The women are denied the knowledge. The women are lied to. The women are manipulated by the imperial agents. So, they become the passive consumers of the grand narrative of imperialism. Right? The grand narrative imperialism, which is romantic, which is noble, which is civilizing, uh, you know, which is out there to do great things for the world, etc. So, they become the helpless passive consumers uh, into this kind of a discourse. So, the entire thing becomes quite tragic, the entire thing becomes quite sickly tragic, because the men have to come back and lie and that is obviously very pathological and the women are just receiving this false romantic reports and this entire system, uh, you know, becomes what could say is the horror, the horror the hollowness of European imperialism. So, just to conclude, so you know we looked at imperialism from different standpoints, from the ideological standpoint, from the political standpoint, from the colonial standpoint, from the imperial standpoint and all these are connected if you look at it from a gendered standpoint, right? Because you know, imperialism is a very gendered enterprise. It relies entirely, almost entirely on this masculinist motive of profit making, expansion, territorialization, etc. Right? So, that motive is unrevealed to be a sinister, evil, hollow motive because that is what it exactly is. You know, it does not have any ideological you know, uh, backing, it does not have any, any righteousness on its side, it does not have any kind of nobility, it does not have any kind of goodness uh, in him, it is just an evil enterprise. So, the entire idea of the European goodness, nobility, uh, rationality, logic, civilization, etc. So, all these discourses, all these constructs are revealed to be hollow, hollow constructs entirely. They are ontologically hollow, they are philosophically hollow, and they are completely hollow categories of knowledge. And this knowledge of hollowness, this knowledge of nothingness is what Kurz uh, meant when he said the horror, the horror. Okay? So, the horror, the horror because it is a very gendered kind of a thing. It is about this, this entire deconstruction of the European masculinist understanding of life. Right? And obviously, this is something which is related to the female as well because they are lied to, they are they're, they're, they're misinformed and you know the presence of Kurtz is intended as this very passive consumer of falsehood, this very passive consumer of lies that come from the imperial uh, you know, peripheries. So, she becomes an example of the European insider uh, who is lied to by the imperial agents who come back and lie to them about what happened in the colonies, about what happened in the imperial uh, you know, outposts. Uh, and you know they get a romantic report which help them perpetrate the belief that the imperialism is a grand civilizing mission. But of course, we know better, of course, Marlow knows better, of course, Kurtz knew better 
an entire knowledge that it is not a grand enterprise, an entire knowledge that it is not a noble enterprise. This constitutes the horror in Heart of Darkness, right? And it's a very gendered kind of understanding. It's a very gendered understanding because it's also an example of ungendering, as I mentioned. This entire masculinous uh, construct of knowledge, nobility, are all ungendered. It all breaks down together in Heart of Darkness, and that constitutes the horror in Heart of Darkness. So, in that sense, it's a very neurotic novel, it's a very dark novel, it's a very grim novel about the collapse of imperialism as a grand narrative. Right? So, I hope you got some understanding of Heart of Darkness. I would encourage you to read the novel in more details uh, using the theories, using the understanding that we just discussed uh, from the lenses of gender studies. Uh, so, I hope you produce uh, a good, uh, you, know, you know, you write something on it, uh, hopefully a paper, hopefully some assignment, but more importantly, uh, hopefully this will give you an understanding of an imperial novel looking at it from a gendered perspective and you can sort of really generate rich readings out of it if you look at it that way. Okay? So, thank you for uh, uh, listening, thank you for attending this particular class. Uh, this concludes our reading of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. We will now move on to the next text in this particular course, which will be a short story called The Fly by Catherine Mansfield. So, I will see you in the next lecture. Thanks for your attention.